Chapter Nineteen of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But Hewitt need not have increased his torments by imagining that Hurst was still talking to Rachel. The party very soon broke up, the Flushings going in one direction, Hurst in another, and Rachel remaining in the hall, pulling the illustrated papers about, turning from one to another her movements expressing the unformed restless desire in her mind. She did not know whether to go or to stay, though Mrs. Flushing had commanded her to appear at tea. The hall was empty save for Miss Willet, who was playing scales with her fingers upon a sheet of sacred music, and the Carters, an opulent couple who disliked the girl because her shoelaces were untied, and she did not look sufficiently cheery, which by some indirect process of thought led them to think that she would not like them. Rachel certainly would not have liked them if she had seen them, for the excellent reason that Mr. Carter waxed his moustache, and Mrs. Carter wore bracelets and they were evidently the kind of people who would not like her. But she was too much absorbed by her own restlessness to think or to look. She was turning over the slippery pages of an American magazine, when the hall door swung, a wedge of light fell upon the floor, and a small white figure upon whom the light seemed focused, made straight across the room to her, "'What, you here?' Evelyn exclaimed. "'Just caught a glimpse of you at lunch, but you wouldn't condescend to look at me.' It was part of Evelyn's character that, in spite of many snubs which she received or imagined, she never gave up the pursuit of people she wanted to know, and in the long run generally succeeded in knowing them, and even in making them like her. She looked round her. I hate this place. I hate these people, she said. I wish you'd come up to my room with me. I do want to talk to you. As Rachel had no wish to go or to stay, Evelyn took her by the wrist and drew her out of the hall and up the stairs. As they went upstairs two steps at a time, Evelyn, who still kept hold of Rachel's hand, ejaculated broken sentences about not caring a hang what people said. Why should you, if one knows one's right? And let em all go to blazes. Them's my opinions. She was in a state of great excitement, and the muscles of her arms were twitching nervously. It was evident that she was only waiting for the door to shut to tell Rachel all about it. Indeed, directly they were inside her room, she sat on the end of the bed and said, I suppose you think I'm mad. Rachel was not in the mood to think clearly about any one's state of mind. She was, however, in the mood to say straight out whatever occurred to her, without fear of the consequences. Somebody's proposed to you, she remarked. How on earth did you guess that? Evelyn exclaimed, some pleasure mingling with her surprise. Do I look as if I'd just had a proposal? You look as if you had them every day, Rachel replied. But I don't suppose I've had more than you've had. Evelyn laughed rather insincerely. I've never had one. But you will. Lots. It's the easiest thing in the world. But that's not what's happened this afternoon exactly. It's, oh, it's a muddle, a detestable, horrible, disgusting muddle. She went to the washstand and began sponging her cheeks with cold water, for they were burning hot. Still sponging them and trembling slightly, she turned and explained in the high-pitched voice of nervous excitement. Alfred Parrott says I've promised to marry him, and I say I never did. Sinclair says he'll shoot himself if I don't marry him, 
and I say, well, shoot yourself. But of course he doesn't. They never do. And Sinclair got hold of me this afternoon and began bothering me to give an answer and accusing me of flirting with Alfred Parrott and told me I'd no heart and was merely a siren. Oh, and quantities of pleasant things like that. So at last I said to him, Well, Sinclair, you've said enough now. You can just let me go. And then he caught me and kissed me, the disgusting brute. I can still feel his nasty hairy face just there, as if he'd any right to, after what he'd said. She sponged a spot on her left cheek energetically. I've never met a man that was fit to compare with a woman, she cried. They've no dignity. They've no courage. They've nothing but their beastly passions and their brute strength. Would any woman have behaved like that, if a man had said he didn't want her? We've too much self-respect. We're infinitely finer than they are. She walked about the room, dabbing her wet cheeks with a towel. Tears were now running down with the drops of cold water. It makes me angry, she explained, drying her eyes. Rachel sat watching her. She did not think of Evelyn's position. She only thought that the world was full of people in torment. There's only one man here I really like, Evelyn continued. Terence Hewitt. One feels as if one could trust him. At these words Rachel suffered an indescribable chill. Her heart seemed to be pressed together by cold hands. Why, she asked, why can you trust him? I don't know, said Evelyn. Don't you have feelings about people? Feelings you're absolutely certain are right. I had a long talk with Terence the other night. I felt we were really friends after that. There's something of a woman in him. She paused as though she were thinking of very intimate things that Terence had told her. So at least Rachel interpreted her gaze. She tried to force herself to say, Has he proposed to you? But the question was too tremendous, and in another moment Evelyn was saying that the finest men were like women, and women were nobler than men. For example, one couldn't imagine a woman like Lila Harrison thinking a mean thing or having anything base about her. How I'd like you to know her, she exclaimed. She was becoming much calmer, and her cheeks were now quite dry. Her eyes had regained their usual expression of keen vitality, and she seemed to have forgotten Alfred and Sinclair and her emotion. Lila runs a home for inebriate women in the Deptford Road, she continued. She started it, managed it, did everything off her own bat, and it's now the biggest of its kind in England. You can't think what those women are like, and their homes. But she goes among them at all hours of the day and night. I've often been with her. That's what's the matter with us. We don't do things. What do you do? she demanded, looking at Rachel with a slightly ironical smile. Rachel had scarcely listened to any of this, and her expression was vacant and unhappy. She had conceived an equal dislike for Lila Harrison and her work in the Deptford Road, and for Evelyn M. and her profusion of love affairs. I play, she said, with an affectation of stolid composure. That's about it, Evelyn laughed. We none of us do anything but play. And that's why women like Lila Harrison, who's worth twenty of you and me, have to work themselves to the bone. But I'm tired of playing, she went on, lying flat on the bed and raising her arms above her head. Thus stretched out, she looked more diminutive than ever. 
I'm going to do something. I've got a splendid idea. Look here, you must join. I'm sure you've got any amount of stuff in you, though you look, well, as if you'd lived all your life in a garden. She sat up and began to explain with animation. I belong to a club in London. It meets every Saturday, so it's called the Saturday Club. We're supposed to talk about art, but I'm sick of talking about art. What's the good of it? With all kinds of real things going on round one. It isn't as if they'd got anything to say about art either. So what I'm going to tell em is that we've talked enough about art, and we'd better talk about life for a change. Questions that really matter to people's lives. The white slave traffic, women's suffrage, the insurance bill, and so on. And when we've made up our mind what we want to do, we could form ourselves into a society for doing it. I'm certain that if people like ourselves were to take things in hand instead of leaving it to policemen and magistrates, we could put a stop to prostitution. She lowered her voice at the ugly word. In six months. My idea is that men and women ought to join in these matters. We ought to go into Piccadilly and stop one of these poor wretches and say, now look here, I'm no better than you are, and I don't pretend to be any better. But you're doing what you know to be beastly, and I won't have you doing beastly things, because we're all the same under our skins. And if you do a beastly thing, it does matter to me. That's what Mr. Bax was saying this morning, and it's true, though you clever people— you're clever too, aren't you? Don't believe it. When Evelyn began talking, it was a fact she often regretted. Her thoughts came so quickly that she never had any time to listen to other people's thoughts. She continued without more pause than was needed for taking breath. I don't see why the Saturday Club people shouldn't do a really great work in that way, she went on. Of course, it would want organization, someone to give their life to it, but I'm ready to do that. My notion's to think of the human beings first, and let the abstract ideas take care of themselves. What's wrong with Lila, if there is anything wrong, is that she thinks of temperance first, and the women afterwards. Now there's one thing I'll say to my credit, she continued. I'm not intellectual or artistic or anything of that sort, but I'm jolly human. She slipped off the bed and sat on the floor, looking up at Rachel. She searched up into her face as if she were trying to read what kind of character was concealed behind the face. She put her hand on Rachel's knee. It is being human that counts, isn't it? She continued. Being real, whatever Mr. Hurst may say. Are you real? Rachel felt much as Terence had felt, that Evelyn was too close to her, and that there was something exciting in this closeness, although it was also disagreeable. She was spared the need of finding an answer to the question, for Evelyn proceeded. Do you believe in anything? In order to put an end to the scrutiny of these bright blue eyes, and to relieve her own physical restlessness, Rachel pushed back her chair and exclaimed, In everything, and began to finger different objects. The books on the table, the photographs, the freshly-leaved plant with the stiff bristles, which stood in a large earthenware pot in the window. I believe in the bed, in the photographs, in the pot, in the balcony, in the sun, in Mrs. Flushing. 
she remarked, still speaking recklessly, with something at the back of her mind forcing her to say the things that one usually does not say. But I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Mr. Bax. I don't believe in the hospital nurse. I don't believe... She took up a photograph and, looking at it, did not finish her sentence. That's my mother, said Evelyn, who remained sitting on the floor, binding her knees together with her arms, and watching Rachel curiously. Rachel considered the portrait. Well, I don't much believe in her, she remarked after a time in a low tone of voice. Mrs. Murgatroyd looked indeed as if the life had been crushed out of her. She knelt on a chair, gazing piteously from behind the body of a Pomeranian dog, which she clasped to her cheek, as if for protection. And that's my dad, said Evelyn, for there were two photographs in one frame. The second photograph represented a handsome soldier, with high regular features and a heavy black moustache. His hand rested on the hilt of his sword. There was a decided likeness between him and Evelyn. And it's because of them, said Evelyn, that I'm going to help the other women. You've heard about me, I suppose. They weren't married, you see. I'm not anybody in particular. I'm not a bit ashamed of it. They loved each other somehow, and that's more than most people can say of their parents. Rachel sat down on the bed with the two pictures in her hands and compared them, the man and the woman who had, so Evelyn said, loved each other. That fact interested her more than the campaign on behalf of unfortunate women which Evelyn was once more beginning to describe. She looked again from one to the other. "'What do you think it's like?' she asked, as Evelyn paused for a minute. "'Being in love.' "'Have you never been in love?' Evelyn asked. "'Oh, no. One's only got to look at you to see that,' she added. She considered... I really was in love once, she said. She fell into reflection, her eyes losing their bright vitality and approaching something like an expression of tenderness. It was heavenly, while it lasted. The worst of it is, it don't last. Not with me. That's the bother. She went on to consider the difficulty with Alfred and Sinclair, about which she had pretended to ask Rachel's advice. But she did not want advice, she wanted intimacy. When she looked at Rachel, who was still looking at the photographs on the bed, she could not help seeing that Rachel was not thinking about her. What was she thinking about then? Evelyn was tormented by the little spark of life in her which was always trying to work through to other people, and was always being rebuffed. Falling silent, she looked at her visitor, her shoes, her stockings, the combs in her hair, all the details of her dress, in short, as though by seizing every detail she might get closer to the life within. Rachel at last put down the photographs, walked to the window and remarked, It's odd. People talk as much about love as they do about religion. I wish you'd sit down and talk, said Evelyn impatiently. Instead, Rachel opened the window, which was made in two long panes, and looked down into the garden below. That's where we got lost the first night, she said. It must have been in those bushes. They kill hens down there, said Evelyn. They cut their heads off with a knife. Disgusting. But tell me, what— I'd like to explore the hotel, Rachel interrupted. She drew her head in and looked at Evelyn, 
who still sat on the floor. "'It's just like other hotels,' said Evelyn. "'That might be, although every room and passage and chair in the place had a character of its own in Rachel's eyes. But she could not bring herself to stay in one place any longer. She moved slowly towards the door. "'What is it you want?' said Evelyn. "'You make me feel as if you were always thinking of something you don't say. Do say it.' But Rachel made no response to this invitation either. She stopped with her fingers on the handle of the door, as if she remembered that some sort of pronouncement was due from her. "'I suppose you'll marry one of them,' she said, and then turned the handle and shut the door behind her. She walked slowly down the passage, running her hand along the wall beside her. She did not think which way she was going, and therefore walked down a passage which only led to a window and a balcony. She looked down at the kitchen premises, the wrong side of the hotel life which was cut off from the right side by a maze of small bushes. The ground was bare. Old tins were scattered about, and the bushes wore towels and aprons upon their heads to dry. Every now and then a waiter came out in a white apron and threw rubbish on to a heap. Two large women in cotton dresses were sitting on a bench with blood-smeared tin trays in front of them and yellow bodies across their knees. They were plucking the birds and talking as they plucked. Suddenly a chicken came floundering, half-flying, half-running into the space, pursued by a third woman whose age could hardly be under eighty. Although wizened and unsteady on her legs, she kept up the chase, egged on by the laughter of the others. Her face was expressive of furious rage, and as she ran she swore in Spanish. Frightened by hand-clapping here, a napkin there, the bird ran this way and that in sharp angles, and finally fluttered straight at the old woman who opened her scanty grey skirts to enclose it, dropped upon it in a bundle, and then holding it out cut its head off with an expression of vindictive energy and triumph combined. The blood and the ugly wriggling fascinated Rachel, so that although she knew that someone had come up behind and was standing beside her, she did not turn round until the old woman had settled down on the bench beside the others. Then she looked up sharply, because of the ugliness of what she had seen. It was Miss Allen who stood beside her. "'Not a pretty sight,' said Miss Allen, although I dare say it's really more humane than our method. "'I don't believe you've ever been in my room,' she added and turned away as if she meant Rachel to follow her. Rachel followed, for it seemed possible that each new person might remove the mystery which burdened her. The bedrooms at the hotel were all on the same pattern, save that some were larger and some smaller. They had a floor of dark red tiles. They had a high bed, draped in mosquito curtains, they had each a writing-table and a dressing-table, and a couple of armchairs. But directly a box was unpacked, the rooms became very different, so that Miss Allen's room was very unlike Evelyn's room. There were no variously coloured hat-pins on her dressing-table, no scent-bottles, no narrow curved pair of scissors, no great variety of shoes and boots, no silk petticoats lying on the chairs. The room was extremely neat. There seemed to be two pairs of everything. The writing-table, however, was piled with manuscript, and a table was drawn out to stand by the armchair, on which were two separate heaps of dark library books in which there were many slips of paper sticking out at different degrees of thickness. 
Miss Allen had asked Rachel to come in out of kindness, thinking that she was waiting about with nothing to do. Moreover, she liked young women, for she had taught many of them, and having received so much hospitality from the Ambroses, she was glad to be able to repay a minute part of it. She looked about accordingly for something to show her. The room did not provide much entertainment. She touched her manuscript. Age of Chaucer, age of Elizabeth, age of Dryden, she reflected. I'm glad there aren't many more ages. I'm still in the middle of the eighteenth century. Won't you sit down, Miss Vinrace? The chair, though small, is firm. Euphues. The germ of the English novel, she continued, glancing at another page. Is that the kind of thing that interests you? She looked at Rachel with great kindness and simplicity, as though she would do her utmost to provide anything she wished to have. This expression had a remarkable charm in a face otherwise much lined with care and thought. Oh, no, it's music with you, isn't it? she continued, recollecting. And I generally find that they don't go together. Sometimes, of course, we have prodigies. She was looking about her for something, and now saw a jar on the mantelpiece which she reached down and gave to Rachel. If you put your finger into this jar, you may be able to extract a piece of preserved ginger. Are you a prodigy? But the ginger was deep and could not be reached. Don't bother, she said, as Miss Allen looked about for some other implement. I dare say I shouldn't like preserved ginger. You've never tried? inquired Miss Allen then I consider that it is your duty to try now. Why, you may add a new pleasure to life, and as you are still young. She wondered whether a button-hook would do. I make it a rule to try everything, she said. Don't you think it would be very annoying if you tasted ginger for the first time on your deathbed and found you never liked anything so much? I should be so exceedingly annoyed that I think I should get well on that count alone. She was now successful, and a lump of ginger emerged on the end of the button-hook. While she went to wipe the button-hook, Rachel bit the ginger, and at once cried, I must spit it out. Are you sure you have really tasted it? Miss Allen demanded. For answer, Rachel threw it out of the window. An experience, anyhow, said Miss Allen calmly. Let me see. I have nothing else to offer you, unless you would like to taste this. A small cupboard hung above her bed, and she took out of it a slim, elegant jar filled with a bright green fluid. Creme de menthe, she said. The cure, you know. It looks as if I drank, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, it goes to prove what an exceptionally abstemious person I am. I've had that jar for six and twenty years, she added, looking at it with pride as she tipped it over, and from the height of the liquid it could be seen that the bottle was still untouched. Twenty-six years, Rachel exclaimed. Miss Allen was gratified, for she had meant Rachel to be surprised. When I went to Dresden six and twenty years ago, she said, a certain friend of mine announced her intention of making me a present. She thought that in the event of shipwreck or accident a stimulant might be useful. However, as I had no occasion for it, I gave it back on my return. On the eve of any foreign journey, the same bottle always makes its appearance, with the same note. On my return in safety, it is always handed back. 
I consider it a kind of charm against accidents. Though I was once detained twenty-four hours by an accident to the train in front of me, I have never met with any accident myself. Yes, she continued, now addressing the bottle, we have seen many climbs and cupboards together, have we not? I intend one of these days to have a silver label made with an inscription. It is a gentleman, as you may observe, and his name is Oliver. I do not think I could forgive you, Miss Vinrace, if you broke my Oliver, she said, firmly taking the bottle out of Rachel's hands and replacing it in the cupboard. Rachel was swinging the bottle by the neck. She was interested by Miss Allen, to the point of forgetting the bottle. Well, she exclaimed, I do think that odd, to have had a friend for twenty-six years and a bottle, and to have made all those journeys. Not at all. I call it the reverse of odd, Miss Allen replied. I always consider myself the most ordinary person I know. It's rather distinguished to be as ordinary as I am. I forget. Are you a prodigy, or did you say you were not a prodigy? She smiled at Rachel very kindly. She seemed to have known and experienced so much, as she moved cumbrously about the room that surely there must be balm for all anguish in her words, could one induce her to have recourse to them. But Miss Allen, who was now locking the cupboard door, showed no signs of breaking the reticence which had snowed her under for years. An unfortunate sensation kept Rachel silent. On the one hand, she wished to whirl high and strike a spark out of the cool pink flesh. On the other, she perceived there was nothing to be done but to drift past each other in silence. I'm not a prodigy. I find it very difficult to say what I mean, she observed at length. It's a matter of temperament, I believe, Miss Allen helped her. There are some people who have no difficulty. For myself I find there are a great many things I simply cannot say. But then I consider myself very slow. One of my colleagues now knows whether she likes you or not. Let me see, how does she do it? By the way you say good morning at breakfast. It is sometimes a matter of years before I can make up my mind but most young people seem to find it easy. Oh, no, said Rachel. It's hard. Miss Allen looked at Rachel quietly, saying nothing. She suspected that there were difficulties of some kind. Then she put her hand to the back of her head and discovered that one of the grey coils of hair had come loose. I must ask you to be so kind as to excuse me, she said, rising, if I do my hair. I have never yet found a satisfactory type of hairpin. I must change my dress, too, for the matter of that, and I should be particularly glad of your assistance, because there is a tiresome set of hooks which I can fasten for myself, but it takes from ten to fifteen minutes whereas with your help. She slipped off her coat and skirt and blouse, and stood doing her hair before the glass, a massive homely figure, her petticoat being so short that she stood on a pair of thick slate-gray legs. People say youth is pleasant. I myself find middle age far pleasanter, she remarked removing hairpins and combs and taking up her brush. When it fell loose her hair only came down to her neck. When one was young, she continued, things could seem so very serious if one was made that way. And now my dress. 
In a wonderfully short space of time her hair had been reformed in its usual loops. The upper half of her body now became dark green with black stripes on it. The skirt, however, needed hooking at various angles, and Rachel had to kneel on the floor, fitting the eyes to the hooks. Our Miss Johnson used to find life very unsatisfactory, I remember, Miss Allen continued. She turned her back to the light, and then she took to breeding guinea pigs for their spots, and became absorbed in that. I have just heard that the yellow guinea pig has had a black baby. We had a bet of sixpence on about it. She will be very triumphant. The skirt was fastened. She looked at herself in the glass with the curious stiffening of her face generally caused by looking in the glass. Am I in a fit state to encounter my fellow beings? she asked. I forget which way it is. But they find black animals very rarely have coloured babies. It may be the other way round. I have had it so often explained to me that it is very stupid of me to have forgotten again. She moved about the room, acquiring small objects with quiet force, and fixing them about her. A locket, a watch and chain, a heavy gold bracelet, and the party-coloured button of a suffrage society. Finally, completely equipped for Sunday tea, she stood before Rachel and smiled at her kindly. She was not an impulsive woman, and her life had schooled her to restrain her tongue. At the same time she was possessed of an amount of good will towards others, and in particular towards the young, which often made her regret that speech was so difficult. Shall we descend? she said. She put one hand upon Rachel's shoulder, and stooping, picked up a pair of walking shoes with the other, and placed them neatly side by side outside her door. As they walked down the passage they passed many pairs of boots and shoes, some black and some brown, all side by side, and all different, even to the way in which they lay together. I always think that people are so like their boots, said Miss Allen. That is Mrs. Paley's. But as she spoke, the door opened, and Mrs. Paley rolled out in her chair, equipped also for tea. She greeted Miss Allen and Rachel. I was just saying that people are so like their boots, said Miss Allen. Mrs. Paley did not hear she repeated it more loudly still. Mrs. Paley did not hear. She repeated it a third time. Mrs. Paley heard, but she did not understand. She was apparently about to repeat it for the fourth time, when Rachel suddenly said something inarticulate and disappeared down the corridor. This misunderstanding, which involved a complete block in the passage, seemed to her unbearable. She walked quickly and blindly in the opposite direction, and found herself at the end of a cul-de-sac. There was a window, and a table and a chair in the window, and upon the table stood a rusty inkstand, an ashtray, an old copy of a French newspaper, and a pen with a broken nib. Rachel sat down as if to study the French newspaper, but a tear fell on the blurred French print, raising a soft blot. She lifted her head sharply, exclaiming aloud, It's intolerable. Looking out of the window with eyes that would have seen nothing even had they not been dazed by tears, she indulged herself at last in violent abuse of the entire day. It had been miserable from start to finish. First the service in the chapel, then luncheon, 
then Evelyn, then Miss Allen, then old Mrs. Paley blocking up the passage. All day long she had been tantalized and put off. She had now reached one of those eminences, the result of some crisis, from which the world is finally displayed in its true proportions. She disliked the look of it immensely. Churches, politicians, misfits, and huge impostures. Men like Mr. Dalloway, men like Mr. Bax, Evelyn and her chatter, Mrs. Paley blocking up the passage. Meanwhile the steady beat of her own pulse represented the hot current of feeling that ran down beneath, beating, struggling, fretting. For the time her own body was the source of all the life in the world, which tried to burst forth here, there, and was repressed now by Mr. Bax, now by Evelyn, now by the imposition of ponderous stupidity, the weight of the entire world. Thus tormented, she would twist her hands together, for all things were wrong, all people stupid. Vaguely seeing that there were people down in the garden beneath, she represented them as aimless masses of matter, floating hither and thither, without aim except to impede her. What were they doing, those other people in the world? Nobody knows, she said. The force of her rage was beginning to spend itself, and the vision of the world which had been so vivid became dim. It's a dream, she murmured. She considered the rusty inkstand, the pen, the ashtray, and the old French newspaper. These small and worthless objects seemed to her to represent human lives. We're asleep and dreaming, she repeated, but the possibility which now suggested itself that one of the shapes might be the shape of Terence roused her from her melancholy lethargy. She became as restless as she had been before she sat down. She was no longer able to see the world as a town laid out beneath her. It was covered instead by a haze of feverish red mist. She had returned to the state in which she had been all day. Thinking was no escape. Physical movement was the only refuge. In and out of rooms, in and out of people's minds, seeking she knew not what. Therefore she rose, pushing back the table, and went downstairs. She went out of the hall door, and turning the corner of the hotel, found herself among the people whom she had seen from the window. But owing to the broad sunshine after shaded passages, and to the substance of living people after dreams, the group appeared with startling intensity, as though the dusty surface had been peeled off everything, leaving only the reality and the instant. It had the look of a vision printed on the dark at night. White and grey and purple figures were scattered on the green, round wicker tables. In the middle the flame of the tea-urn made the air waver like a faulty sheet of glass. A massive green tree stood over them as if it were a moving force held at rest. As she approached, she could hear Evelyn's voice repeating monotonously, Here, then, here, good doggy, come here. For a moment nothing seemed to happen. It all stood still, and then she realized that one of the figures was Helen Ambrose, and the dust again began to settle. The group indeed had come together in a miscellaneous way one tea-table joining to another tea-table, and deck-chairs serving to connect two groups. 
but even at a distance it could be seen that mrs flushing upright and imperious dominated the party she was talking vehemently to helen across the table ten days under canvas she was saying no comforts if you want comforts don't come but i may tell you if you don't come you'll regret it all your life you say yes at this moment mrs flushing caught sight of rachel ah there's your niece she's promised you're coming aren't you having adopted the plan she pursued it with the energy of a child rachel took her part with eagerness of course i'm coming so are you helen and mr pepper too as she sat she realized that she was surrounded by people she knew but that terence was not among them from various angles people began saying what they thought of the proposed expedition according to some it would be hot but the nights would be cold according to others the difficulties would lie rather in getting a boat and in speaking the language mrs flushing disposed of all objections whether due to man or due to nature by announcing that her husband would settle all that meanwhile mr flushing quietly explained to helen that the expedition was really a simple matter it took five days at the outside and the place a native village was certainly well worth seeing before she returned to england helen murmured ambiguously and did not commit herself to one answer rather than to another the tea-party however included too many different kinds of people for general conversation to flourish and from rachel's point of view possessed the great advantage that it was quite unnecessary for her to talk over there susan and arthur were explaining to mrs paley that an expedition had been proposed and mrs paley having grasped the fact gave the advice of an old traveller that they should take nice canned vegetables fur cloaks and insect powder she leant over to mrs flushing and whispered something which from the twinkle in her eyes probably had reference to bugs then helen was reciting toll for the brave to st john hurst in order apparently to win a sixpence which lay upon the table while mr hewling elliot imposed silence upon his section of the audience by his fascinating anecdote of lord curzon and the undergraduate's bicycle mrs thornbury was trying to remember the name of a man who might have been another garibaldi and had written a book which they ought to read and mr thornbury recollected that he had a pair of binoculars at anybody's service miss allen meanwhile murmured with a curious intimacy which a spinster often achieves with dogs to the fox terrier which evelyn had at last induced to come over to them little particles of dust or blossom fell on the plates now and then when the branches sighed above rachel seemed to see and hear a little of everything much as a river feels the twigs that fall into it and sees the sky above but her eyes were too vague for evelyn's liking she came across and sat on the ground at rachel's feet well she asked suddenly what are you thinking about miss warrington rachel replied rashly because she had to say something she did indeed see susan murmuring to mrs elliot while arthur stared at her with complete confidence in his own love both rachel and evelyn then began to listen to what susan was saying there's the ordering and the dogs and the garden and the children coming to be taught her voice proceeded rhythmically as if checking the list and my tennis and the village and letters to write for father 
and a thousand little things that don't sound much, but I never have a moment to myself, and when I go to bed I'm so sleepy I'm off before my head touches the pillow. Besides, I like to be a great deal with my aunts. I'm a great bore, aren't I, Aunt Emma? She smiled at old Mrs. Paley, who with head slightly drooped, was regarding the cake with speculative affection. And father has to be very careful about chills in winter, which means a great deal of running about, because he won't look after himself any more than you will, Arthur. So it all mounts up. Her voice mounted, too, in a mild ecstasy of satisfaction with her life and her own nature. Rachel suddenly took a violent dislike to Susan, ignoring all that was kindly, modest, and even pathetic about her. She appeared insincere and cruel. She saw her grown stout and prolific, the kind blue eyes now shallow and watery, the bloom of the cheeks congealed to a network of dry red canals. Helen turned to her. Did you go to church? she asked. She had won her sixpence and seemed making ready to go. Yes, said Rachel. For the last time, she added. In preparing to put on her gloves, Helen dropped one. You're not going, Evelyn asked, taking hold of one glove as if to keep them. It's high time we went, said Helen. Don't you see how silent everyone's getting? A silence had fallen upon them all, caused partly by one of the accidents of talk, and partly because they saw someone approaching. Helen could not see who it was, but keeping her eyes fixed upon Rachel, observed something which made her say to herself, So it's Hewitt. She drew on her gloves with a curious sense of the significance of the moment. Then she rose, for Mrs. Flushing had seen Hewitt too, and was demanding information about rivers and boats which showed that the whole conversation would now come over again. Rachel followed her, and they walked in silence down the avenue. In spite of what Helen had seen and understood, the feeling that was uppermost in her mind was now curiously perverse. If she went on this expedition, she would not be able to have a bath. The effort appeared to her to be great and disagreeable. It's so unpleasant being cooped up with people one hardly knows, she remarked. People who mind being seen naked. You don't mean to go? Rachel asked. The intensity with which this was spoken irritated Mrs. Ambrose. I don't mean to go, and I don't mean not to go she replied. She became more and more casual and indifferent. After all, I dare say we've seen all there is to be seen, and there's the bother of getting there, and whatever they may say, it's bound to be vilely uncomfortable. For some time Rachel made no reply, but every sentence Helen spoke increased her bitterness. At last she broke out. Thank God, Helen, I'm not like you. I sometimes think you don't think or feel or care to do anything but exist. You're like Mr. Hurst. You see that things are bad, and you pride yourself on saying so. It's what you call being honest. As a matter of fact, it's being lazy, being dull, being nothing. You don't help. You put an end to things. Helen smiled as if she rather enjoyed the attack. Well, she inquired. It seems to me bad, that's all, Rachel replied. Quite likely, said Helen. At any other time, 
Rachel would probably have been silenced by her aunt's candour. But this afternoon she was not in the mood to be silenced by any one. A quarrel would be welcome. "'You're only half alive,' she continued. "'Is that because I didn't accept Mr. Flushing's invitation?' Helen asked. "'Or do you always think that?' At the moment it appeared to Rachel that she had always seen the same faults in Helen, from the very first night on board the Euphrosyne. In spite of her beauty, in spite of her magnanimity, and their love. "'Oh, it's only what's the matter with every one!' she exclaimed. "'No one feels. No one does anything but hurt. I tell you, Helen, the world's bad. It's an agony. Living. Wanting. Here she tore a handful of leaves from a bush and crushed them to control herself. The lives of these people, she tried to explain. The aimlessness. The way they live. One goes from one to another. And it's all the same. One never gets what one wants out of any of them. Her emotional state and her confusion would have made her an easy prey if Helen had wished to argue, or had wished to draw confidences. But instead of talking, she fell into a profound silence as they walked on. Aimless, trivial, meaningless, oh no! What she had seen at tea made it impossible for her to believe that. The little jokes, the chatter, the inanities of the afternoon had shriveled up before her eyes. Underneath the likings and spites, the comings together and partings, great things were happening, terrible things, because they were so great. Her sense of safety was shaken as if beneath twigs and dead leaves she had seen the movement of a snake. It seemed to her that a moment's respite was allowed, a moment's make-believe, and then again the profound and reasonless law asserted itself, moulding them all to its liking, making and destroying. She looked at Rachel walking beside her, still crushing the leaves in her fingers and absorbed in her own thoughts. She was in love, and she pitied her profoundly, but she roused herself from these thoughts and apologized. I'm very sorry, she said, but if I'm dull, it's my nature, and it can't be helped. If it was a natural defect, however, she found an easy remedy for she went on to say that she thought Mr. Flushing's scheme a very good one, only needing a little consideration, which it appeared she had given it by the time they reached home. By that time they had settled that if anything more was said, they would accept the invitation. End of chapter 19